Well, welcome to the South African launch of David Baldacci's latest mega thriller, A Gambling Man. Exclusive Books and Pam Macmillan are hosting this, webca this webcast, so thank you very much indeed for that. And do keep in mind that The Gambling Man is available at all exclusive bookstores and also its website. And I know that there's going to be a run on his latest novel. So you can also reserve a copy, don't forget that. We'll also be taking questions and don't forget that little that little sort of square thing and you can uh, type your questions in and we'll take them a little later on in the show when we finish the interview. But I'm Jenny Cruz Williams and it goes without saying that I'm absolutely thrilled to be hosting the man described as one of the greatest thriller writers in the world. And if you look at the cover of A Gambling Man, now I don't know whether it's anywhere in sight but I'm just gonna hold it up for you. That's what it looks like on the shelves. Um, if you look at the cover of A Gambling Man, you'll see a little shout by Bill Clinton. I want to know who phoned whom, of course, but that'll come up a little later on. Just a few notes on David. He has got sales in excess of 150 million, and I want to faint, um, in 80 territories and 45 languages. He's published 40 novels so far, but it, that is probably out of date already. Seven books for children. His first novel, and some of you were around then, was Absolute Power and was published back in 1997. Not all that long ago, but enough. It was made into a smash hit movie, of course. And I think A Gambling Man, also, the book we're going to be talking about now, is an absolute shoe-in for a movie. He lives in Virginia with his family, and if his website is telling the truth, and I think it probably is, he's sometimes locked into his office and told that he can't come out and watch Midsummer Murders until he's finished writing what he's supposed to be writing. <laughs> There's so much more, but you get uh, you get the picture. David Baldacci, welcome to South Africa. Is that a true story? It, yeah, I look, uh, uh, Chief Inspector Tom Barnaby, I, I love John Nettles in that role. I mean, I, I've watched them all. I, I'm a huge British mystery fan in you know, everything from Hercule Poirot to Sherlock Holmes to Jane Marple to Midsummer Murder. Brit Box is one I dial up all the time. So. I, um, I, I definitely, yeah, my, they don't lock me in, but uh, if I open the door, they frown at me. Very <laughs> 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 back to my little to continue to play. <laughs> And are you good about that? You do go back. I, yeah, uh, I'm, I'm very disciplined when, you know, I write pretty much every single day. Uh, I write until the tank is empty. I don't really count words or pages. I just go until I don't have anything else to say, and then I come back the next day. Well, a gambling man is set in post-World War II California because it says 1949. But you know, by the time you get into the book, you've kind of forgotten the date. So you go back and, and it starts ringing bells with you. And you ask people to write about what interests you rather than what you know. So I'm interested in knowing what was it that interested you about post-World War USA and California in particular? You know, my, my dad was a product of that generation. He fought in World War II, as did all, all I had nine uncles who all fought in World War II. Um, incredibly, all nine of them came back alive. Um, and the, the post-World War II in the United States and across the world, but the one, the one that I, I experienced in my dad was just, um, just upheaval, this transition. Uh, he had gone through a depression. He had gone through a world war. Um, people were sick of fighting, sick of sacrifice, and they wanted something new, you know, pull up their roots and try something different. Um, and my father did that as well. So I was interested in how a country responded to both the depression and the World War. And for a lot of people, they wanted something brand new. They were tired with the old, in with the new. And a lot of them headed west. And a lot of them headed to California because that was the land of gold, the land of beautiful women, and the land of, you know, anything was possible. The film industry was booming back then. Man planes were being manufactured. Cars were being manufactured. It really was the golden state. Um, but what intrigued me as a thriller mystery writer was that whenever you have a lot of potential, a lot of wealth being generated, guess what goes along with that crime goes along with that. So if you sort of up into the country, you know, a lot of dollars slid down to California, but so did a lot of interesting criminal criminals and syndicates and schemes and things like that. So that's why I headed west in this book. And also, of course, the mafia must have been there at that stage. Was it, I mean, early mafia, I presume, except Al Capone had been around for years and years and years. Yeah, I mean, he was dead. Yeah, he, yeah that's right. He, he died of syphilis when he was in prison. But um, you also had like the Lucky Lucianos of the world, the Bugsy Sequels of the world. Vegas was just starting to boom. You know, the Rat Pack was out there. Sinatra was there. 
Um, and while you couldn't gamble in California, except at, at the race course in these what are called card clubs, um, a lot of people go to uh, Las Vegas to gamble. There was a lot of money there. So the mafia sort of swung back and forth between the two states. They had a big footprint in, in Vegas. They also had a big footprint in California where a lot of the money they made in Vegas was laundered through those businesses. So let's talk about, let's talk about your characters. So, and you're going to have to help me here. So Aloysius, is that correct? Yeah, Aloysius. 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 Well, yes. I thought it was, and then I kept looking at it, and I looked up in the dictionary, and it didn't help me to, except to say it was Germanic. Yes. So, it, 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 well, I mean, there's a, there's another question there, but anyway, Aloysius, Aloysius Archer, Liberty Callahan, Private Eye. I mean, I love this man, Willie Dash. I have to love him, and for everybody who's listening, um, there's a description of Willie Dash, who is a kind of older Private Eye. And he is going to, in the book, and I'm not spoiling it, um, um, he is going to employ, although it doesn't really sound like it at the beginning, Aloysius Archer. And the description of him, he wears a toque that looks like a baby skunk without a stripe. So you know exactly what it looks like. And when he puts it on his head, you want to cringe a little bit because you know it's been under the bed and you know it's, you don't want to think about it too much. So, so here's this question about Aloysius. You sometimes donate um, uh, or donate character uh, naming opportunities to nonprofit organizations. Is that how you got that name? Because it's very rare in the United States, as I understand. You know, it's, it's, it's so weird. Sometimes names are hard for me, but I have to tell you, um, I was sitting in Canada, Toronto, in the middle of a snowstorm. I was up there on publicity. Um, and I just finished all my work for the day, got back to the hotel. I really didn't, um, you know, sleep well on the road. And I thought, you know what, I'm staring out of this blinding snowstorm. I'm going to write uh, a short story and it's going to have this guy and the name popped in my head, Aloysius Archer. He's going to be post-World War II. He's going to want to be a private eye. He fought in the war hmm. and I'm going to start this book. It's going to be a short story, one good deed. I'm going to write like 50 pages and, and we're going to see what's going to happen. And within a few months, I had 400 pages. Uh, and one good deed was done. Nobody knew I was even writing it. So I sent it up to my agent, and the publisher. They were like, oh my God, where did this come from? I said, well, I was in Canada and it was snowing. <laughs> so, and I was <laughs> bored. Um, so I just wanted to write this story. I, I love that time period, crime noir. You know, I was in Dashiell Hammett, Raymond Chandler, Ross McDonald. I mean, just the greats of that era um, and, 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 and genre. Um, but Aloysius, I don't know why. Um, for me, it's always struck me sort of a Jesuit name. You know, I could imagine a Jesuit priest scholar having a name like Aloysius. Um, and my family is Catholic, um, and I know there are some Aloysiuses out there. Um, but for whatever reason, the name popped in my head, and it was very alliterative. Obviously, Aloysius Archer, and it fit. And so I didn't, I said, I'm done. That is his name, and we're going to go from there. And did you have a, a, a clear image of Aloysius? I mean, did you? I mean, obviously, he, he fought in World War II, and he won't talk about it, but, but it is now 1949. But did you have a clear did you have a clear image of him right from the start or did he grow as you went along? I had a base for him. I knew that he was going to be a, a, a young man who could take care of himself physically. Um, but in many ways, he was going to be somewhat naive. If you think about it, you know, his life was he would have, was in college, then he um, fought in the war, then he got in trouble, was in prison. So he hasn't really seen a whole lot of life as an adult. Um, that's normal. I mean, there's nothing normal about war. So I was gonna, I was gonna make him to be sort of naive and a little bit gullible and susceptible. And one good deed, he certainly was all of those things. Um, but in a gambling man, he's gone through some life now, and uh, so he's a little bit less naive than he was, a little bit uh, more cynical. And I finished the third Archer book. It'll be out next year. Um, where now it's 1953, and he is a gumshoe private eye in Hollywood, in the golden age of Hollywood, where all you know the great stars that we think about Hollywood during that time period. And he definitely has grown a lot since 1949, a lot. Well, I mean, some of his growing up, of course, is in a gambling man. I yes. didn't know until I started. Uh, Pam McMillan didn't tell me um, yes. that there was a book previous to that, One Good Deed, and then a gambling man. So it, it, they run one into the other. And you know, when JK Rowling um, started uh, writing about um, Hogwarts and, uh, you know, and all of that, she claims that right at the very beginning, right at the beginning, she was able to map the whole story of, um, 
of Hogwarts and, and you know, the, the whole thing and the owls and um, dementors and things like that. Do you do that with these shortish series that you do? No, I mean, I really like to let the, the, the books grow organically for me because I feel like when I'm in the trenches and what I mean, not outlining and outline is great and, and hats off to JK Rowling to be able to do that. Um, but for me, um, the story becomes compelling and sort of a little bit intuitive while I'm writing it, not while I'm sitting there doing an outline. The outlining is just, okay, they're going to do this. This is the backstory, blah, 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 blah. But when you get into the trenches, I, I use the analogies of you want to learn how to drive a Formula One car. You can do it two ways. You can read a book about it or you can drive it. Um, and I always equate reading a book about it to outlining a novel. Um, you're not actually writing the novel. You're thinking about what you want to put into the novel. When you're driving the Formula One car, you're not thinking about driving it. You are driving it, you know, pitfalls and all. So I feel like when I'm immersed in the story, that's what I'm thinking the best and, and have the greatest clarity about the story and the characters because I'm living that adventure. So in an outline, I might've said, well, Aloysius Archer, when he runs into this obstacle, he would do this. When I'm in the story writing it, I may look at that outline and go, no way in the world that would ever work. You know, I'm in the story now. I know what he would do now. And it's not that. So that's the difference between the two. And so I like to live in the story. And that's where I, I, I create things. That's where I think of plot lines and twists and turns and subplots and where the characters get fleshed out in the moment for me. And I, I'm not saying outlining isn't good. A lot of writers outlining are incredibly successful. Keep doing it that way. I just say that every writer needs to find the way that's best for them. And for me, being in the moment is the best for me. And how, how, how do you detach yourself? I mean, when you come out of your, out of your office and, uh, and you have to come face to face with your wife or maybe your children and whatever, because you're deep inside that creative, I mean, yeah. you really are deep inside it and you write like a maniac, I know. So how, how, how easy is it to detach yourself? It's not easy at all. It's very, very difficult, actually. My my wife will tell you a story about, you know, that we're at a, we're at a Christmas party and I'm sitting over the corner looking like this. <laughs> Somebody comes by and asks Michelle, Michelle, is David okay? He looks like he's had a stroke. And she looks at him and she's like, no, he's just, he's just finishing a chapter. Give him 15 minutes. She goes, we have another drink. Thank you. <laughs> Well, I mean, you, you could do what, and I, I don't want to spoil it, not for a single second. So we, now we've got to Aloysius and we've done Private Eye, Willie Dash, so to speak. Uh, Liberty Callahan. Now there are, I think I've counted five gorgeous looking dames and they are dames because you only had dames in the 1940s, didn't you? You know, there's nothing yep. like a dame, you know, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. And Liberty Callahan, I mean, she's one hell of a dame. So where did she come from? Did, did, did you dream her up at that time? Because you had to have a dame. If you had Aloysius, you had to have a dame, at least one. At least one. And I think, you know, back then when um, women had almost no rights, there was no equality at all. And so they really had to rely on other things. You know, sometimes it was their looks, sometimes it was their style, their swagger. Sometimes it's like making sure they were always in the background supporting the man who they needed to get their goals accomplished. And sort of Liberty Callahan for me, I wanted Archer to have someone on parity with him and equal going on her own journey, her own odyssey to find her dream as well. He wanted to be a PI, she wanted to be an actress. I didn't want him to go on that journey alone because I didn't think he was ready to do that. Plus I wanted him to have some companionship, but equal companionship, not somebody who was just gonna roll over. Um, and Callahan knows exactly what she wants. And on the surface, much like Archer, there is just this forceful swagger, you know, but underneath there's this vulnerability. There's an uncertainty, this doubt at times too, because she's in a profession where she's judged every second of every day by her performance, you know, and, and there's lots of other people competing who are really good too. And she could be hot today and gone tomorrow. And she understands that. But um, so Callahan, she really jumped out of my mind. I wanted her to be sort of bigger than life. When she was on the page, she would have these great lines and sort of take over the, the scenes. But I had interspersed that with some moments in the book where she talks about having doubts and, you know, being vulnerable and sometimes asking Archer, you know, well, you know, you order for me. I'm not really sure what any of this stuff is. And that was, a, you know, I think a memorable moment for them. But I, I think just because of the time period, I, you know, I was done when I was researching the third Archer book it was 1953 and I had, you know, Callahan, she's an actress and she's doing okay. And she bought a house. And I was like, I better check that. So I went back and checked it in 1953 in the United States, a woman could not get a bank loan. 
um, she had to have a male co-signer. You know, if she wasn't married, she had to find some guy who could co-sign the loan for her. It wasn't until the 1980s in this country where women could actually get a credit card in their own name. Because uh, I guess banks didn't think that women were credit worthy. Um, so that, those are stunners for me. So I think Callahan embodies the female spirit back then. They know that the whole deck was stacked against them. They still know, knew what they wanted out of life and they went after it in a different way. And, and, and they talked tough, as you said, because she does talk tough and she does more than talk. Um, <laughs> but <laughs> but um, I mean, I keep thinking of Rita Hayworth yeah. And, you know, because she was 1940s and then she faded, obviously, but with that incredible hair and, and people were obsessed with breasts as long as you didn't see too much of them and, and uh, whatever, you know, you know what I'm, I'm saying. And, um, but there was Rita Hayworth, I always thought was hard boiled, but actually underneath it, I think she was, I think she was jellyfish. Yes, I think so too. And I, it, she played the, she played the role well. Not just since she was in front of the camera, but in life as well. If you sometimes you look at women. Um, I look at she, you know she was married to Orson Welles for a while. You look at Marilyn Monroe, who was married to Arthur Miller. You know, very cerebral uh, men uh, at the at the head of their professions. Um, and I think that there was, in some ways, you know, a father figure in those men because they were older that these women could look up to. Both of them didn't have you know idyllic childhoods. Um, but also back then, I think they were smart enough to realize that one, another way to get ahead um, and maybe to expand themselves was to marry men uh, who were seen as brilliant and cerebral and accomplished in those fields because those women felt like they would never get that same respect. You know, even to this day, neither Rita Hayworth nor Marilyn Monroe were given you know, their just due as actresses. They were both fine actresses. Um, but a lot of them just looked at, you know, it's just the pretty girl who, you know, went along for the ride. That's just the way it was back then, unfortunately. I think it also drove their men absolutely crazy, um, the, the adulation. I mean, once they got them, but the men, other men still wanted them and they still flaunted themselves. Yeah. And um, so that, that was hard. But there's Liberty Callan. I love, I love the name. And those are the main characters. Then there are another four. Each one of them is absolutely gorgeous. These hard, mostly hard boiled women because they were hard boiled in that particular era. And there's a little bit of Catherine Hepburn for me that, that comes into, into one character in particular. And um, she, she's a toughie and uh, Catherine Hepburn was a toughie. And I think she was tough underneath as well, by the way. So, um, but, but, there's a fourth character, isn't there, in all of this, and it's a car. Now you have to tell, now I, I, I don't know whether you guys who are watching this, whether you can see this, but behind me, just can you see where I'm pointing? There is, we, we've tried to light it with not much success, but there is this gorgeous, gorgeous car. It's bright red. David, you've got to take over from me because it is a very sexy vehicle and there are hardly any, you know, there are not many of them around. That is a 1939 Delahaye model 165. It's blood red and has a burgundy top. Uh, Delahaye was a French automobile maker. Uh, and back then in that time period, you had people who were engineers who had built the interior, the engine. They knew nothing about building an exterior. So Fiaggi and Falashi were Italian um, uh, craftsmen who uh, were brought on to build the exteriors of all the Delahaye vehicles. And as you can see in that picture, it's just an absolutely stunning vehicle. It rides so low to the ground, you can barely see the white wall tires. It looks like you're sort of riding in a cloud. Um, and I went on Archer. I saw a Delahaye uh, a number of years ago before I even wrote One Good Deed. And I thought, this is an amazing car. If I ever write a book in that time period, my, my, my character is going to have this car. So Did you, have, you driven, have, you, have you had a ride in it? I haven't driven in one. I've sat in one. Um, they're, I mean, they're old cars and right now they're typically just for show. Uh, although I think that, you know, some of them, there, there were only like six, six of the Model 165 ever made. Uh, these days they would go for millions of dollars just because they're so rare and still, you know, so beautiful. And it's kind of interesting because the steering wheels are, are, are it's a lucite. So the steering wheel can be the, match the color of the car or just be glass. And so it's almost like you're holding invisible steering wheel in your hand and this gear shift is not a big stick shift. The little gear shift is on the steering column. It comes out like this. It's also made of lucite, and it's just sort of like this big. It's almost like a little joystick uh, from the 1930s. So, 
Yeah, that is that's Archer's pride and joy. Well, he, he uh, the car, it's a she, I guess, yes. um, gets, gets more page, uh, she's in more pages than any other character other than Aloysius, uh, <laughs> because she's just there every single day. And actually, I, I actually thought she was going to come to a bad end, and I'm not spoiling anything. Um, maybe she does in another book, uh, who knows, I don't know. But I mean, she is, just go along to Google, guys, and uh, just Google it, and you will see how beautiful this is. I wonder if I can, no, I can't really, but it is anyway, it's behind me and maybe just enlarge your screens or something like that. So, I mean, it's a dream car for so many people. So now, David, when I was about 14, I was reading Georgette Hare. I was reading kind of, you know, period, the Scarlet Pimpernel and they seek him here, they seek him there. And I was a romantic and, and, and whatever. And my uncle was a newspaper man. And he came to me one day and he said, why are you reading this sort of stuff? And I said, well, because I love it. And he said, no, he said, you cannot love this. I'm going to give you a real book to read. And he gave me a book and I looked at it and it was well-worn and it was Farewell, My Lovely. Hmm. It was Raymond Chandler. So I, as I was reading through the beginning, you're setting the scene there in Reno, then they get in a car and um, drive around and et cetera, et cetera, and things were happening. And I was just listening to the conversation because the one thing that, that Raymond Chandler did was he was great at conversations and so are you. And, and his farewell, you know, his lines and things were absolutely incredible. So I fell in love with, um, with Raymond Chandler and of course, Philip Marlowe, the quintessential the absolute quintessential gumshoe cop. I said, not a cop, I suppose, um, yeah, detective, really, you know. And um, and those three books, I think for me, it was The Long Goodbye, Farewell, My Lovely, and The Big Sleep. Yeah. Um, and that, that those stayed in my head. And I started thinking, I'm sure David has been reading, I'm sure he's been reading Raymond Chandler. And then I thought, no, no, and it, it's totally different, And but it is the right era. And then I got to page 55, and on page 55, the name Bogart comes up. So I'm thinking, Bo <laughs> Lauren McCall and Humphrey Bogart, you know, and you, you know what to do when you want me, don't you? You just put your lips together and blow, you know? <laughs> yeah, no, I mean, was that sexy or was that sexy? It was just brilliant. So, so anyway, I'm thinking, okay, well, that's just, by the end of the book, I mean, I just, the question that I had in my head is Aloysius, is he, is he, um, um, what is his name, uh, Philip Marlowe? Yeah, he definitely uh, is in that tradition. And I, you know, I've been a huge fan of Raymond Chandler for a long time. Um, the thing about Chandler is that his prose was as good as any writer out there, regardless of genre. Just as the word selections, his vocabulary, uh, the pacing and style of what he talked about. His plots were good as well, but I read Chandler for the beauty of the words and the descriptions and the dialogue, as you mentioned, his dialogue was just crackerjack and not, there wasn't a wasted word in it at all. You know, it was, nothing was diluted by having, you know, being verbose. Um, and I tried to practice that, you know, in the novels that I write, and certainly in, in this one, I didn't want to have anything in there that wasn't necessary to the plot, but I wanted to have every word count. And, you know, writers out there could do far worse than going, going back and rereading Raymond Chandler or Ross MacDonald if they want to write in this genre, or if they just want to write well at all, because uh, both those writers did it exceptionally well. And Big Sleep is one of my favorite movies of all time, ranks right up there with Chinatown for me. And, uh, Bogart and Bacall were, you know, talk about casting, you know, dream cast. Um, but they really, and I'll tell you, you know, the funny story about Raymond Chandler, when they when they were filming The Big Sleep, William Faulkner wrote the screenplay for The Big Sleep, you know, Nobel oh. Prize. And nobody could figure out from the book who killed the chauffeur <laughs> who ended up off on Lido Pier in the car off of Lido Pier. It so wasn't so. Mm -hmm. Yeah, they, they sent William, they sent Raymond Chandler a telegram back then. And they said, who killed the, the chauffeur and why? So <laughs> Antler sent a very terse reply back that basically said, I don't know. <laughs> so in the, in, the script, in the script, Faulkner had to sort of come up with a reason and it works fine. But um, 
it's just that with, with Chandler, um, you know, for him, plots were secondary. Uh, and the plot in, in The Big Sleep is, is terrific, but it's the prose, it's the storytelling where he really thrived and lived. And you just have to just sit back in astonishment how good he was. I mean, it's like reading a good columnist, isn't it? I it mean, if you, if you get a, it's not so much what they say, it's how they say it. And when the language is just beautiful, you melt into it and you don't, and you remain a fan forever. But I've written down some of um, um, Raymond Chandler's, um, well, his similes, I suppose. He had a heart as big as one of Mae West's hips. Now, I mean, isn't that, if you did that today, you'd probably be sued. You know that. Yes, you yes. would. Yes. Mary J. Blige or something like that. Can you imagine? You, <laughs> you'd be in court. Dead men are heavier than broken hearts. I can, I can see Bogey saying that. The muzzle of the Luger looked like the mouth of the second street tunnel. And then, and then I turn to, and I've, I've got the page here, just in case you think I'm fibbing, because um, I check up on people all the time. Um, <laughs> so, I mean, you know, it's just curiosity. Uh, this page 278. Um, so, um, so here we've got Aloysius, and he's knocking on Liberty's um, bedroom door because they don't sleep together. So there they are. So he knocks on, on her door. He's had a hard day, actually. And uh, she opens it and she's standing there and she's thrilled to see him, really thrilled. And he's quite thrilled that she is looking thrilled. And he says, I have a favor to ask. Liberty gets so excited, but she's controlling it. She said, well, then you better come in. It would be humiliating for you if I turned you down in public. <laughs> it's wonderful. How did you think of that? Because it was just fantastic. <laughs> You know, I think that's a, it's a, it's a great line you, you brought up because it sort of dovetails nicely into writing in the moment. Um, and I could not have outlined that line because I, I, I needed to be with those two people in that doorway, in that house, and in their heads. And, and when you're doing an outline, trying to organize stuff, organization is fine as a framework, but organization does not always breed creativity. But when I, I'm in the moment with those two, that's where that line came from. Because why? Because it made complete sense to me that she would say that mm -hmm. at time mm -hmm. and that moment, knowing who she was as a character. So I really, I really do. I know it sort of maybe sounds a little trite when you immerse yourself in the story, but that's where those types of lines come from when you're totally in the heads of those characters. It was almost like I didn't even write the line. It was like Liberty whispered it into my ear, and then I just typed yeah. it. And 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 you you've kept her alive because she's got to appear in another book. Because, yes. because they're all sorts of unanswered questions. So when you're reading this book, guys, uh, just, just there's certain things that Liberty does and they're not resolved in this book. Uh, they're questions that, that are unanswered. That, so I knew another one had to come. I didn't know, because I think it was so sneaky, um, that you'd practically finished the third one yes. where maybe some of these questions will be answered. Yes, I know. I, I, um, for some reason, I, um, with Archer's character and their Archer stories, the stories come really quickly for me and I write them really quickly. Um, I don't know because it's in the moment, it's because I love I love this genre so much. Maybe I have a very, very clear sight line of what I want the characters to do, but mainly I think it's just excitement. I have all this stuff inside of me, I just wanna pour it out onto the screen. And um, so I, I took probably, you know, books can take years to write. I've taken, th I took three years to write my first novel, Absolute Fire, because I was working full time as a lawyer but the Archer books, you know, I think for a first draft, you know, two months uh, and the first draft was done. And then, um, which is very fast for me. Um, but I think it's because I'm just, I'm full of joy writing in this genre and I love it so much. Well, um, well, well, well I'm glad you used that word because I was going to say, say to you, I read this book with a light heart. Yeah. I was so delighted in the period. I was delighted with the car. I'm not interested in cars, but I was delighted with it. I was just, I loved, I mean, I absolutely loved Aloysius, but Willie Dash, Willie Dash, who's seen better days. He's not, he's not a well guy. He's not going to see 90. And, uh, and he's got this terrible black toupee on his head. <laughs> Boy, he's got it, hasn't he? He's, he's honorable, he's shrewd. He's, he's, and he gives, he gives Aloysius a chance as well. And that, that you can see the beginning of a quite a profound relationship between the two. 
um, in this novel. That was one thing, you know, when you read, like when you read Dash and Hammett, Sam Spade, Philip Marlowe, um, and you read Lou Archer uh, from Ross MacDonald, they just start off from the get-go being PIs who are already experienced in veteran and they know what they're doing. And you learn about their backstories a little bit. They were all cops before, and now they're detectives. I wanted to do it a little bit differently. I wanted to have sort of this blank slate. Archer, who was a good guy, soldier, he can take care of himself, but knows nothing about being a PI. He was in prison for a few years, so he's got that black mark against him. So I wanted to sort of go beyond, because I would have loved to have had a book where Philip Marlowe was just starting out, and how did he learn the trade? You know, who yeah. taught him? So this is my way of sort of doing it for Archer to allow Willie Dash to be his mentor, a second father to him, uh, to teach him how to, to live and work in a very, to, to sometimes very dangerous occupation, um, to live by his wits, make quick decisions, make good ones, uh, know you're going to make some mistakes and you have to, you have to be, you know, three-dimensional chess. You have to be, can't take anybody's word for anything because you have to assume, I always assumed this when I was a lawyer, even my own clients, I assumed everybody was lying to me. <laughs> You know, so unless I could corroborate it from another source, I never believed anything anybody told me. And Archer is being taught that same thing by Billy Dash. Just because somebody tells you something does not make it true, son. And you just got to keep digging and asking questions. So that was a fulfillment. That, that was the role for Billy Dash. Not only was he a, he a great character and he appeared on the page and sort of dominated it because he was, he was six steps ahead of everybody all the time. Um, but he was a great mentor. And so when Archer in the next book comes out and he's a different guy and experienced and knows what he's doing, you know, hats off to Willie Dash. Hands up. Well, Willie Dash, I think, is, is lovely and, and, and sad uh, because he's not well. Um, you know, and he gets too excited when someone gives him a case. But, but you know, that's, that's so, I mean, here we are talking about all these characters. But in the meantime, there's this, uh, this mean story going on in the background and the foreground and whatever. And it's all mixed up. So you've got to keep your wits about you. And I, I do look for clues when I'm reading books. And I know that they're strewn all over the place. So if I've got time and I go back, I'll start to ask, but I'm not while I was reading it this time round, because it's, it's absolutely fantastic. And the criminals um, are... They're nasty. They're nasty. They're different to today's murderers and, and things like that. But they, they are a nasty bunch. Every single one is a duplicitous as well. Yeah, I, I think back then, I mean, these days, you know, you can steal a billion dollars from somebody and never meet them. Just do it all online, you know, ransomware, malware, um, scheming, and computer. All you need is, you know, keystrokes on your computer back then. You needed to manip manipulate people and bend them to your will, but do it to their face um, and then spin them around and stab them in the back um, while you're smiling the whole time. And I think that's what made that era so incredible for crime writers that all of the stuff took place, you know, face to face confrontation. There was not, you know, a, a personal cloud between you and the person you were trying to screw over. Um, it was, you know, mano y mano. Um, and for me, that made it much more personal. Uh, if you're gonna, if you're gonna have, and I and I ask my characters, you know, if if in, I write a scene where somebody is gonna lose their life, people say, how do you write your action scenes? And I say, I slow them down, uh, because if somebody is going to be hurt or somebody's going to be killed, you need to give that scene its due. And the way you do that is to slow everything down so that the reader can understand how terrible this really is. Um, I hate movies and books where a guy comes, walks into a room and kills 12 guys in like 12 seconds and it takes a half a page and then you're done, you move on. That doesn't give the due to what you just wrote about. One of the best movies I've ever watched that did this was from 1992, I think, Unforgiven with Clint Eastwood, who was a Western. Um, and he shot a guy in the belly. Um, and then they spent the entire day talking back and forth to each other while the guy slowly bled out and eventually died. Um, and I remember this scene, you know, almost 30 years later because it was so vivid because Eastwood as a director, he slowed everything down um, and made you feel the horror and the pain and the anguish of the person who was being killed and the guilt of the person who killed him. Um, so for me, you know, back then it was all in your face. It was personal confrontation. And these, these criminals and the people who had bad intent, they were slick and they were smooth. Um, and they said all the right things, and in the, but in the background, it was a totally different story. I think, I think one of the reasons why one likes Aloysius so much is because 
he's learned to look around corners as a soldier, a soldier in World War, World War II. He didn't see America, he says, for three years. And, and so he's, he's battle hardened. And that's how he survived, being in prison. Um, and I've got to go back to the first book. But, but uh, and he was unromantic about things. I mean, he had a soft spot for women, but most men do. So, so that didn't, you know, faze me at all. And he knew it as well, of course, that he, he, he needed to, you know, be careful. Um, but I, I think that he was, he was, he could spot when danger was coming his way. He knew it. He knew when danger was coming his way and he did know how to react immediately. And that made it very appealing because it was kind of clean fighting as opposed to, you know, horrible things that happen, you know. Right. And I think that was an important part of his, his because the thing you have to decide when you're building a character like that, what tools do you have to give them in order to allow them to plausibly su survive what you're going to throw them into? So for him, I knew that psychically he was going to be, you know, he's only 27. He's going to be somewhat immature, not proven mentally, not have the instincts that a Willie Dash might have. I said, okay, but so how is he going to survive all this stuff? Well, I made him a soldier. As you said, he was a scout. He'd been in combat. He knew how to look out for himself. He knew to watch for the signals of danger. And then when danger came, he could take care of himself. And I needed that to be grafted into his character because otherwise, I mean, he didn't have that. How could he even survive the first book? All the stuff that yeah. So you have to give mm -hmm. characters the necessary tools to plausibly get through. Otherwise, readers just won't buy it. They'll look at that and go, how in the world did he survive that? He doesn't know anything. He's never fought, blah, blah, blah. So that I needed to give him that part, that element on his character. And then the rest of it, sort of the mental side and the instinct side and, and the experience side, you know, comes from Willie Dash and actually just doing cases. You, you sometimes read um, novelists uh, over and over again. And one of them was Harper Lee. Well, that's not difficult. There's only one book, really, um, <laughs> you know, To Kill a Mockingbird. And, and I kept thinking of Scout and I kept thinking of her father. I kept thinking of Gregory Peck yeah. um, in the movie. And there's, there's a touch of that also in, in this book, I feel. Yeah, there is. You know, Mockingbird is one of my favorite books. You know, I read Ghost Center Watchmen as well. Um, there were elements of the beautiful writing that you saw in Mockingbird in the novel as well. Um, and Harper Lee, look, if you're only going to write one book, <laughs> let it be that book because, it yes. but I, I do. And, and books that I've read have stayed with me. You know, Gregory Peck is Atticus Finch is one of my favorite characters. I think it's, it's a rare thing where the movie I think was as good as the book. Um, nine times out of 10, the book is always better because I, I've, I've adapted some of my, my books for film and all that. And the first thing you ask yourself is what do I cut out? got to cut out, you know, most of the book. I, I jokingly tell people, if you want to take a 400 page book and made it into a, a movie, you know, it'll be four or five hours long. It has to have two elements. It has to have a young, beautiful couple falling in love and a really big ship sinking for a really long time. <laughs> <laughs> you have those two elements, people will sit their butts in a chair for four hours. Other than that, you got to cut it down. <laughs> <laughs> well, listen, when I closed, um, when I closed A Gambling Man, and um, I just thought, this is a movie. Have you had a movie offer? Um, we haven't yet. We have two TV series in development for two of my other series characters, John Puller, the military investigator, and Amos Decker, who's my memory man, detective. Um, I agree with you and the people that I know that work with me on the film side think it'll be a terrific piece, um, but convincing executives. So we, you'll, you'll take a, a movie like this or a book like this to executives and they'll like, oh, period piece really costly. Costuming, cars, you know, scenery, just very, very expensive. And even though when you, you know, you point out to them, well, but look at all the period pieces they're doing so fantastically well right now. You know, Queen's Gambit from the 60s, Bridgerton from the 1800s and all that. You can make it happen and the period actually people thrive on watching period stuff. So we will make a, a really good effort. The books, have all, you know, both books are the number one bestsellers. Um, I think that, you know, uh, film people sort of, you know, chase success um, and somebody out there will pick up a gambling man or one good deed and go, this will make a great movie. And they might be in a position to make it happen. And if so, it'll happen. I, I've long since, you know, I've had movies and television series made. I've long since uh, passed agonizing about it. Um, I always tell people, you know what, it, I'll know what will happen for sure, if I see it on the screen or I go to a movie theater and there it is. Otherwise, then there's no guarantee that it will happen. 
But I will tell aspiring writers out there, this piece of advice has always worked well for me. People, I've, people always ask me, how much control do you have over the movie part? You know, do you want to ma manage everything? And I said, here's, here's my litmus test. You never want to have so much control over a movie or television project such that it, if it fails, they can blame you mm -hmm. and they will. <laughs> mm -hmm. So be involved, but keep your distance. Now, listen, I, I mean, you do know that I could go on for hours, but I can't. You know, because we, you know, we're limited. So let's um, let's see if we've got some calls, and um, and let me see. I'm going to press a little button and see whether I can get it. So we've got Tracy Fox, and Tracy uh, asks, how long does it take you to complete a novel from concept through to completion? You know, it really varies. Like absolute power again, because I was working full time, took about three years because I wrote that in the middle of the night. Probably, you know, the average for my first 20 books or so was about a solid year for each book. And then I got into a two book a year schedule. Um, I stopped writing some other things, screenplays and things like that. So then every book was taking me around six or seven months. Ironically, during the pandemic, the only silver lining to this horror that's happened across the globe is that, you know, my touring was canceled. I just sat in my, in my house and wrote. So my last four or five books, I think each one probably took me an average of maybe four months uh, from concept to com completion. Because you were, were you working around the clock? I really was, you know, I, I didn't do anything else. There was nothing else to do. You know, you didn't go anywhere. You didn't see anybody. Um, again, it was a silver lining in a horrible, otherwise horrible situation. Um, I think it'll probably go back, you know, to being taking me longer. Uh, but over the years, I've gotten more economical. I've gotten smoother and better about how I do what I do. I know how to hit my marks. I know how to get into the mood and, and the time, you know, the sort of the mental frame to write well and be efficient at it. Um, I don't sit down and sort of beat my head against the wall. If I, if I, the words aren't coming, I just go off and do something else. I'll go take a shower. I've, I've solved some more plot problems in a shower than I can tell you. And, and the added, you know, attribute to that is that I'm exceptionally clean all the time. <laughs> well, that's very nice to hear. You're behind your ears as well, no doubt. Right. So, listen, I just love this. I'm not sure if we've got any more calls. Uh, let me just double check and see. So we've got, oh, Ellie Forsyth. That's quite a nice name. Ellie, is it real? Um, and she asks, will the pandemic appear in any of your contemporary series? That's a really great question. At this point, I would say no. Um, there's one book that I'm working on now where I only reference, you know, you know, post-pandemic sort of stuff. I feel like, you know, the world is sick of COVID and the pandemic, and people read my books to escape from things. I'm not interested in writing about it. There are just too many bad memories and thoughts and experiences with it, and I don't think people want to be reminded of that. So I think that my general rule is, no, I'm not going to write about it. It's too painful, actually, isn't it? Yes. It's just, it's just uh, the memories are too hard. And my final question to you, and what are you going to do the moment you turn your back on this conversation? Are you going to pour a glass? I, could, I've got, I have to share this with you. I've got a lovely man who makes wine. Ah. And, <laughs> and this is just yummy. And uh, that's what I'm going to do. I'm going to have a lovely glass of wine. What are you going to do? I think that I, right now we're down in, in, at our lake house uh, in, in Southern Virginia on the water. I think I'm either gonna go out on, on a sea dew uh, and ride across the lake, or I'm gonna jump on my sailboat or I might do a paddleboard, but I'm gonna go out on the water. And will you be thinking at the same time? Absolutely. <laughs> Aloysius and everybody else will be out there with me. Well, David Baldacci, I cannot tell you how much I've enjoyed this conversation. So thank you very, very much indeed. Well, thank you. I enjoyed it very much, too. Thank you. Until next time.